And I want to thank uh, Carla Wilkie for joining us, and she's going to uh, give us uh, her insights on uh, being able to feed cows in confinement. And Carla's not only got a lot of research uh, behind this, but also has some practical experience doing it at home. So I think uh, she's probably one of the best speakers we can possibly have on this particular topic. Um, we've talked a little bit in the past couple uh, webinars about what do you do if you don't have a mixing truck? And now today we're going to talk a little bit more about what you can do if you do have a mixing truck and all the opportunities that brings to, to be able to use some lower cost feed resources, but also talking about you know some of the challenges with managing cows in confinement and thinking about how to manage those cows and those calves. Thank you, Mary. That's a fantastic introduction there. Um, and so, yeah, we're just going to talk about feeding cows in confinement and, and try to focus some on how to make it work with the resources you have. And as she said, I'm out at the Panhandle in Scott's Bluff, and I've been there since 2009, and I've been doing confined cow research for about 12 years. And then Todd and I have an integrated farm beef cow operation with 80 spring calving cows in partial confinement and 80 fall calving cows in full confinement. And so we're going to talk about some things from both of those uh, ends of the spectrum. So some of the key points for confinement feeding that regardless of the resources that you have that are important points to remember if you're doing this is that limit feeding dry matter while meeting the nutrient requirements is important for reducing feed costs. So what we're talking about there is um, limiting the actual amount of feed, but having it um, high enough nutrient density that it still meets their needs. And so that's that becomes pretty important for the economics of the thing. And the other thing is that gestation and lactation have vastly different nutrient requirements. And if you're in confinement, you got to make sure you're on the right um, level for that. And another really important point that we will spend a little time discussing is the calf needs um, and how much they feed they need in addition to the milk to develop the rumen and growth structure. And so I wanted to include in here a link that it was November of 2020 when we did a, um, a webinar on confinement feeding. And in that webinar, we looked at a lot of different um, diet examples and things. And so if you want to take a picture of that with your phone or screenshot it or whatever works for you, that's a link to another um, webinar that we did that um, might be useful if you want to sit down and watch that recording at some point in time as well. Um, we also have a, um, a NEB guide called Management Considerations for Beef, Cows, and Confinement. And if you're like me, sometimes you like to go back and read over things again. Um, it's easier to remember. And if you go to ianrpubs.unl.edu and you they have a little um, search bar thing, G2237 is the number that they've assigned to this NEB guide. And if you just type that in there and search for that, then this should come up and then you can download it or print it, whatever. And that can be, that might be helpful to you as well. And um, so, so let's just talk a minute about um, this, this nutrient needs, okay? So I put this together to maybe hopefully make this be a visual for you to help understand this. So this is pounds per day of gray bar is TDN or total digestible nutrients or the energy that's required for the animal and the red bar is crude protein, okay? So late gestation, we've got a fetus starting to require quite a bit but no lactation. And this is where we are in that first um, bar set of bars on the left. Next set over, we've gone into early lactation. And so you can see how much the energy needs of that cow jump um, because of lactation and the, and the protein as well. Okay, so we know that, but then let me show you something else. So sometimes producers will say, well, I saved my best meadow hay for when my cows start calving and then I increase the distillers based cubes that I feed, okay? All right, well, what you see there is the amount of TDN in that, you know, really high quality meadow hay um, and that uh, if she's fed, what you can eat of that plus three pounds of a distiller's grains, uh, dried distillers, whatever. 
okay, you still see that that doesn't meet the needs of early lactation. And that may work out okay if that cow is in really good condition. So she's got some condition to, to give. And then maybe in three weeks or so, she's going out to green grass. And so she'll be on an increasing plane of nutrition. And so maybe she's going to make that work okay. Because if we look at the what is provided in grazed grass in June for most of Nebraska there, we see that um, she probably is not only meeting her needs for early lactation, but maybe even a little extra. And so that's really good. The problem is um, we are in a confinement situation. We have to provide that. So I think that intuitively most of us know, well, yeah, lactation would require more energy than late gestation. Yeah, I get that. But sometimes I don't think we, we understand how uh, big that difference is when we don't realize what it's going to take on our end if we're providing it instead of the grass that they might be normally out there grazing. And so that becomes really important to the success of this because um, if we don't meet her needs in early lactation, um, the thing she's not going to do is cycle and then she's not going to rebreed. So if we look at what might be a diet when we're moving from gestation to lactation, um, then um, we can see that um, we have a diet here that's pounds of dry matter, pounds as is. Um, if you're a nutritionist, you may want it in dry matter, as is actual feed that goes in the mixture per cow. Uh, quite a bit more uh, for the wet distillers grains and the silage because they have a lot of moisture in them. So we have to account for that water weight. But um, I like a diet like this because it allows me to use the ground corn stalks, which is usually one of my cheaper roughages. Um, and then the distillers is going to provide me some energy and some protein that she needs. The corn silage helps me not have to use quite so much distillers and reduces the amount of bulky corn stalks in it. Um, and then you'd need to put that with a vitamin mineral package, obviously. But this diet would then provide 17 pounds of TDN, three pounds of crude protein, but it's only 24 pounds of dry matter. So that for is, you know, for 1200 pound cow, it's still slightly under 2% of her body weight. So she's, it's not horribly limiting, but she would definitely clean that up, um, be a little cheaper than feeding her ad lib. So that would be an option of, of something that we might do there. Um, bunk space is really important. And so at a minimum, we're going to need about two feet per cow and roughly a foot for calves. Uh, I actually, we're going to see some situations where we actually use more than that if it's available. And um, another thing that really helps in a limit feeding situation is consistent feeding routine. So those cows will get pretty good at um, being content and loafing during the day if they know that at the same time every day, you're gonna come around with feed trucking and they are definitely you know, ready to eat and, and waiting on you when the time comes, but they, they get pretty um, mellowed out about it if it's pretty consistent. Bulk in the diet kind of helps with satiety. That's one reason I really like the, the roughage, the cornstalk bales uh, ground up in that diet because it does um, provide them some sense of fill and um, satiety. Uh, knowing the nutrient content of the commodities is important because we can um, overfeed if we're underestimating what it is, and that's expensive, but it's expensive to the cow if we're assuming that it's more than it is, and they start to get thin. So um, that's important to make sure we know what we're dealing with. And then pen space, the research cows have about 430 to 495 uh, square feet per pair, on the farm, they have quite a bit more once we get them caved out and moved out. And um, that's usually 3,800 to 5,100. Um, so quite a bit more in that situation. So we need to talk about the calf a little bit. And I really do wanna spend a fair amount of time talking about meeting the needs of the calf today, because this is a little bit more of a challenge in the confined cow limit fed concept. So this is adapted from a, um, a dairy publication, actually. The dairy industry obviously does a lot of work on the, the calf because he never is with the cow. But when the calf suckles, this esophageal groove up here, I think I can use my mouse and then you can see that, but this esophageal groove closes when the calf um, sucks. 
And so that makes the milk then go past the rumen and the reticulum and go straight into the abomasum, which is the true stomach where they have acid digestion like we do in our stomachs. And so um, the, the abomasum is actually about 60 percent of the true stomach or of the the digestive system there the true stomach is about 60 percent of the digestive system there whereas the rumen's only like 25 percent of the, of the total at this point in the camp and this will be when he's born to when he's about three weeks of age so he's really a non-ruminant when he first gets here and we go over here on the right side and when he's three weeks to just under three months of age he's starting to hopefully eat some dry feed um grains, soluble carbohydrates that he might get in really um, lush grass, that kind of thing. They'll stimulate the growth of the rumen microorganisms and they produce vol volatile fatty acids and that helps the papillae develop in the rumen. We get some fiber in there that helps muscular growth of the rumen so it can churn and, um, you know, they can regurgitate and and then um, move that feed around in the rumen. So all of that's very important to that calf between that three weeks and three months of age stage. But still, if you look at this graph that they did, the, the abomasum is still 30%, the rumen is 60%. So we're getting, we're getting better. But then what the goal is, is down here in phase three, when the calf is three months of age or more, 85% of his digestive system here or his stomachs is is rumen part and um only seven percent abomasum so now he's now he's a true ruminant so he may be a true ruminant at this point but his rumen is tiny and so you know when you look at a cow she's got a huge old vat she can fill that thing full um he cannot I and mean, it doesn't do him i mean he can fill it full but it is it's tiny so he's gonna have more digestible feed that moves through quicker so he can eat more to meet his nutrient needs. So sometimes we have kind of that thought process in our mind that milk's meat and all his needs and he's really, we're not too worried about him eating dry feet until he's weaned when in fact he needs to be developing that rumen so that he can be weaned. And if he's in a confined setting and he's not out there um, in ground and figuring this out on his own, then again, we're going to have to make sure that's happening. So how much forage does a nursing calf eat? Um, this is some research that I did a long time ago on my PhD, actually. And so we have the three-month-old calf, the four-month-old calf, and the five-month-old calf that we measured here. And you can see his body weight is increasing as you go. So he's growing, he's nursing a cow, and he's out on grass. That's what this calf was. So if we put his forage intake uh, as a percent of body weight, if we look at it that way, then it's pretty much just 1.1, 1.2% 1 .1, of his body weight. But the amount of forage that he's eating is continuing to increase because his body weight is increasing. So if we look at it as a forage intake per pounds of organic matter, and we put it in as organic matter instead of dry matter, because um, that takes into account any organic things, yes, the minerals, but also like dirt and sand and stuff that they have a tendency to eat when they're exploring. So you know, on a dry matter basis, this calf's probably going to eat anywhere from two and a half to six pounds of dry matter in roughage or feed or whatever, and still be nursing the cow as well. And so uh, we don't think about that a whole lot when he's out there grazing, but in a confinement system, we've got to somehow provide that for him. So um, the one thing that, that I want to say is that um, confinement feeding uh, with the resources at hand, that was kind of the topic that we decided that I was going to cover. If you have a way to grind, weigh, mix, and deliver feed, it sure increases your options. Um, it's really hard to take something like um, you know, cornstalk bales and say, well, I don't really have a way to mix that or grind that or whatever. And I just want to roll that out and put some cubes on top of it. It's not that we can't do that, but pretty soon after they've sorted through that and picked what they wanted, you might've been better off to buy a better quality hay because uh, you've lost a lot of, you know, what you bought. So I am going to focus, as Mary said, on some of these things that do require putting together a diet, but um, 
that's sometimes if you're going to do this confinement thing, that's that's maybe the best way to to do it if you're going to do it long term. Um, it it also helps to have some type of bunk, uh, and we're going to look at some different things that aren't necessarily a cement bunk that could be doable. Uh, but but having some sort of feeding system like that, that certainly reduces waste. You got to evaluate feed costs, whether you're trying to do this as part of a system because you never have much perennial grass, or if you're looking at this today because you've been in a horrible drought and you have any grass and you're just trying not to sell cows, you really got to evaluate the feed costs versus the value of that gain. Um, calves are worth a lot right now. That, that's promising. It's looking good, but feed costs are awful right now. And so I don't want I, I can help you from a biology standpoint. I can put together any diet you want to, to make those cows do just about anything you want if you give me the right ingredients. But um, we need to make sure that it's going to make sense for that to be the decision that you make. Um, so I like wet feeds. Uh, wet feeds can increase uh, poor quality feeds like residues. It increases their utilization, palatability and it increases the nutrient density of the diet. The other thing I like about silage is that if you can put up more silage than you actually need and you can sell some of that silage, then it helps pay for the producing of silage. And then that kind of takes some of that cost off of your cow operation a little bit too. So um, I'm kind of a fan of silage, like to put it in the diet. Um, we can have a whole nother discussion on my favorite silage truck that I get to drive, but we won't go there tonight. So some other things that uh, could be used to add not only uh, moisture to the diet, but also protein and energy, some minerals uh, are a wet distillers on the right hand side of the screen there. Um, and then um, sugar beets are on the left-hand side. And what these are, and I know not everybody has access to this, but the reason I put this in here is because be an opportunist, look for some of these things like this. What happened was that the sugar beets started to rot in the pile. And so they had to get rid of them. And so the sugar factory was chopping them up at the drop site where they were. And that wasn't very far from our farm. So we were able to to buy those and there's a lot of moisture in them and there's a lot of energy in them, um, a lot of sugar in them. And so mixing that with some wheat straw, we were able to make a mixture that was similar in energy value to corn stalks or I mean to corn silage and, and feed that much cheaper. And so that look for those opportunities. Um, beet pulp is a byproduct of sugar and when the sugar is actually used for human consumption. Again, it's a good wet product and it has some good energy in it. It's usually, you know, not as expensive. So if you can get a hold of that, you know, that's a good thing. If you're on the other side of the state, maybe wet corn gluten feed is something that you have access to and you can put it in there. So my point in that is that a lot of these byproducts, a lot of times do have some moisture to them. They usually have some pretty good energy. Sometimes the protein's really good. Sometimes the protein's moderate, but um, they can help you make this diet and it's, you just got to kind of be um, proactive sometimes about getting access to some of these byproducts and keeping your ears open when some of these things come available. Um, another thing that I wanted to cover was summer annual forage um, silages. So sorghum sedan grass hybrids uh, can make good silage. Obviously cool seasons can make some silage too, but um, summer annual forages as a silage. I really like this because it turns out pretty nice. It's usually much cheaper to produce than the corn silage because the seed's cheaper. That doesn't require as much water and fertilizer and that kind of thing. Um, but it does come with less energy because it doesn't have the chopped up corn kernel and all that starch in there. But it's still a tremendous feed resource in a confinement system. It's really good for cows. And um, you know, you, you have to swab it down usually before you make it so that it dries a little bit because there's so much moisture in it. So what I like about that is, is as I'm going, I'm like, okay, if we have breakdowns and this all goes south on us, we can still make hay. And so somehow that just gives me like, I don't know, a sense of peace or something, knowing I have options for this. But um, sometimes you, you know, put up half the crop for silage, the other half for hay and, and whatever, it doesn't matter. But the point is you've got some options there. 
And um, these are nice in a four year chain with cool season annuals. So maybe you plant a cool season annual in the fall, you use it in the spring, then the next you go in with these summer annuals, then maybe the next thing you go back to a cool season, something like that. There's some, there's a lot of different options and I'm not here to tell you this is the one way that you should do it. But what I'm hoping is that you, you think through some things as I'm talking and think, oh, you know, in our operation, we could, we couldn't do that, but we could make this work. So hopefully that's, that's where you're going with some of this. Um, annual forages as an option for um, partial confinement. A couple of years ago, we were able to uh, put in some triticale in the fall and then the next spring, we were able to go out out on it with pears. And so we estimated, and again, it was a couple of years ago, so I know it would cost more now, but estimated our seed costs. And we did have to use a little more for water than we wanted to. It was drought conditions. Far Western Nebraska's in their third summer of drought. And um, so then we had our planting costs, but we did save some on fertilizer because we spread the manure out of the corrals. So, you know, there's a couple of different ways maybe you could do that to make it cheaper. But um, we figured that to be 81 cents a day per pair. And so that certainly wasn't bad. It allowed us to defer grazing on what little perennial pasture that we had. And then, um, so then we went here and then we went there and then we had to come back in for confinement. So if something like that is something that would work for you, um, you know, maybe you can make that work. We then went into this field with a summer annual after we moved the pears off and we made some hay and some silage out of that. I would love to do this where we can kick pears out on this. I'd love to do this every year. But the problem is that it's not just a beef cattle operation. Things have to be balanced across the farming too. And sometimes that land is better, it's gonna make more per acre doing a, a commodity than it is a forage. And then sometimes, cropping rotations don't always work out where it's convenient and where the cattle are. Things like that happen to us. So um, hopefully you're set up better than we are and you can make those things work. But um, that's not a bad thing either. Um, corn stalk grazing, that can be a great resource as well. Um, you can put dry pregnant cows out there and probably not have to supplement anything more than your vitamin and mineral supplement. But um, we can also put pears out there, but they do require protein and energy supplement um, because the calf gain and the lactation breeding needs of that cow, they're not going to be able to meet that on corn stalks alone. So it does take some supplementation on that. Um, but then corn stalk fields can also be a place to do the confinement feeding. Um, you're not going to, you know, tear up the ground per se. So you can um, drag bunks out there. Or we'll talk about some different ways you can maybe do a bunk line or something. So that might be something that um, is a place for you to go for confinement feeding that works. Um, I also want to talk about managing the calf in a confinement system. Um, There's some, there's some things that we need to think through for the calf. Most confinement facilities, if it's actually, you know, a feedlot type setting or an old feedlot at your ranch where they used to do a grow yard or whatever, um, those are usually built for at least a 700 pound animal. And so a very small calf can often struggle as that one little calf there is barely able to reach the bunk and he's probably going to like here before you get food in his mouth, but um, it's not always set up well for that calf. So that's something to think about. How can you set that up differently for that calf? Um, the, again, with the dairy research, but um, sometimes we don't think about water intake in the nursing calf because we think, well, he's getting you know milk, so he doesn't need water. But a calf has got to have water in the rumen for them to utilize the feed and to grow the microbes and stuff. And so a calf that doesn't ever reach the water is not going to eat well and he's not going to grow well. And the dairy, this dairy research that I um, looked up and cited, they, they had mild temperatures, 70 degrees. They were feeding almost a gallon of milk a day and some starter feed. And those calves were still eating over or drinking over half a gallon of water a day. So imagine if it's 90 degrees, you've got calves in confinement in the summer. Um, they're going to need some water. 
we also know that like human babies are what bodies like 70% water, you know, calf's not a whole lot different than that. So um, they can dehydrate very quickly. And so making sure that if the cows come up and drink the tank down, it fills up quickly, cat, the tank is banked where the calves can reach the water level, you know, things like that. That's, that can be a constant fight sometimes and it irritates me to death, but I spend a lot of time harping on banking tanks um, and not to you guys, to, to people I am close to. Anyway, um, so let's talk a little bit more about research. Um, it's not all just about what we're doing. We actually have some actual data on this. And so this is a study that Dr. Drunowski and I did together uh, at Scott's Bluff. And so we had three treatments where we had a calf that one treatment was the calves were weaned between three and four months of age, and they were fed alfalfa, hay, wet distillers, and corn as their diet. There was an, another treatment where they were not weaned until a more traditional weaning date, so 200 days of age or so, and they only had access to the cow's diet. So they had to eat this wet distillers and wheat straw-based diet. This particular diet didn't have silage in it or anything, and, and they had to compete with the cow for that, but we fed the cows and the calves uh, more because like we tried to account for what the calf would eat, but he had to he had to take it from the cow. Um, we had another treatment where the calves stayed with the cows until they were um, more traditional weaning date, but they had a creek gate in their in the pen, and they were able to go into the next pen. And in that pen's bunk, then we put that same alfalfa hay wet distillers and corn diet that the early weaned calves got, and so they got that as a supplemental creek diet. So those were our three treatments. And so the way that we named those was pears were the calves that stayed with the cows till traditional weaning date, but didn't get extra feed. And the early weaned um, were the calves that were or EW's early weaned. So they, they got weaned, you know, for 420 days. And the creep was the calves that stayed with the cow, but then had access to the that additional early wean diet. And so, but the, so these were. Uh, summer born, these were August, September born calves. And so we started their early wean treatments in December. And then in March was the more traditional wean line. And at that point, those calves on the creep feed, when they really had had a heavier body weight than, than the others, but quite a bit. And the average daily gain was obviously the best for them, followed by the early wean parrots had the worst. Okay. That's kind of what we expected from a biological standpoint. Then we did a growing phase from April to July to see if there was some compensatory gain, if they caught up, or what happened there. And so um, we did see some compensatory gain in the calves that were on the pairs um, in the early wean treatment, I guess. They had a more similar average daily gain, and it was greater than the what the creep fed calves um, then did on the growing diet. But they did not um, outweigh those calves. So they, so basically, what that's saying is the calves that received creep feed when they were nursing, they maintained a weight advantage all the way through the the growing phase. So um, basically, what we could summarize from that study was that the lowest feed cost, but also the lowest gain through the two hundred day weaning, was the pairs. Um, they did compensate some after weaning. The early wean calves had greater feed costs, but also greater gain than the pairs. But then uh, by the time we got done with the growing phase, their returns were similar to the pairs. So a growing phase kind of helped those calves out. The creep fed calves, they had the greatest feed cost, but they had the greatest returns through weaning, and they still maintained that advantage through the the growing phase. So when you put economics to that, those would suggest that if you're selling calves at a traditional weaning date, the supplementation is going to yield the best return. You are not in a position to supplement a growing period is certainly going to improve those returns. So um, that was a research that we did. And we're going to have some thoughts from the farm now. Um, I have, I hate it. I hate the calf having to eat the cow diet. Okay. But this is, this is how it goes with us. 
So it, we have slow digesting, poor quality roughage that we put in the cow diet and that keeps the cow, you know, happier throughout the day. Um, I don't like that the calf not only has competition with the cows for the limit fed diet, but has competition with the other calves and they need to, if they had their choice, they would eat very small frequent meals a lot more than just this once a day feeding. Um, it's difficult to balance increasing the feed the calf needs as he grows with limiting feed in the cow when they're together and that's the only diet they're eating. And there's a tendency for unevenness in the calf crop. Uh, I, I think there's a bigger tendency for it than on grass because I feel like small nuances in differences in milk production are, are more pronounced because they don't have as much opportunity to eat um, you know, other feed. And no, I don't have research data for that. I'm just saying, it seems to me, I noticed that. So what can we do? Um, we're in a situation where I, you know, I don't have the resources to creep feed these calves or whatever. What can I do? Well, one possibility is that, you know, we spread the feed out more than the two feet per cow and one foot per calf. And we put some of it on the ground. I don't like feeding on the ground as a rule because there is a lot of waste there and these cows are getting feed in a bunk but we start at the right after you come through the gate and you spread a little bit there kind of keeps them occupied and you keep you get it in the bunk but then those cows will then kind of mosey on down to the bunk more and it does seem to give those calves a little more space to eat their own feed the downside still is that the cow it's going to get cleaned up fairly well and then six hours from now the calves go I'm going to still be waiting for his next. And that's that's just how that goes. The other thing that you're going to notice about this picture, these cows are in an equipment yard. And um, it's probably not ideal. But are there plans to change this soon? Also, no. It's probably where they're going to be. And that's just how that goes. So what are some creep feeding options? Um, I will say um, there are some benefits to being in the equipment yard. And um, one is that you don't have to buy as much fence if you line up the equipment, right? But anyway, um, so creep feeding options. So on the left is calves in a creep feeder, a traditional type creep feeder. And that's probably your most expensive method of creep feeding because you've got um, the pelleting cost into it. You've got a bagging cost into it, you know, that kind of thing. And it's not always as easy to control how much they're eating, which ones are eating it. The upside of that can be if you're trying to get an ionophore in the calves or something like that, you know, there, there could be a time, a period of time there that you're willing to put that feed in there and get that in them. So there's there can be pros and cons to it, but it's probably not ever going to be your cheapest option of creep feeding. Um, the middle one is a creep gate and similar to what we used in the research setting where we just put it in the fence line and then let them go over into the next pen and eat out of their own bunk and the feed truck was able to just easily go by and, you know, add that other, that second diet. Um, a creep gate could be used like this where you just, you go into another area and the kids can eat that um, and their feed is there. Or uh, what about creep grazing? If you had either some annual forages or some perennial forages, but you didn't have enough to put pears out on, but you were able to set up something like this where the calves could go out and make access or make use of it, and they had access to it and the cows didn't, that might be something that would work well for you um, in a confinement type setting. The other positive thing about that can be if, the, if wherever they're going really secure, then when you're ready to fence line wean, you just make that a solid gate. So there can be benefits to doing that as well. The third one over is one that I really like. Um, I thought it was totally ingenious, but um, this is not our operation. This is somebody else's. But what they did was they, um, they dug kind of a shallow trench. They laid out old irrigation pipe in, uh, on the other side of the little trench. And then they put a hot fence over the top of that. And anywhere they had to put new another length of pipe, they left a little spacing between the two pieces, two ends of the pipe. And the calves were able to walk under that then and not hit the hot wire. So the calves, as you can see in the picture, are, are eating the, the cow's diet, but they're eating it on the other side of the fence from the cow. 
But what you don't see in the picture is that there's some other feeds that are also available to the cow that they can go eat and then they'll come back to their cow. So that was kind of a cheap way to make a bunk. And, um, and it was a cheap way to make um, creep grazing for a cow. So I thought it was pretty cool. So um, one of the treatments that we had was early weaning. And so I want to talk about, you know, that from the standpoint of like incorporating it on our place. So sometimes weaning is a way to, to juggle resources more than anything. And we are in far western Nebraska and we have a limited supply of wet distillers. And in the fall, when the fall run starts at the feedlots, then it becomes tighter. And there are a lot of people that are very hesitant to use their operating note to buy feed resources. They want to feed what they're able to grow. They understand that per unit of energy or whatever, some of these other feeds that they could buy are cheaper, but they cannot make that gap between using their operation note for this and then when they can pay on that with a different crop or whatever. They can't make that come together. And so um, they are hesitant to use that operating note to buy um, feeds. So one thing that I did this year, our spring calves are actually born in April and May. So they're not early spring calves. And so a lot of people would not wean those calves until November, November, but we weaned in mid-October. And the problem we were running into was that um, the cows were getting big enough. They needed more feed. We're feeding these pairs a lot of feed and there, there's the, the need for lactation. There's the need for the growing calf. And then the fall cows, you know, had already calved. And so they had a big diet and we were just needing more distillers than we really could get on our contract. And that was an issue. And so we went, weaned the calves, and then we were able to put the distillers in their diet, but obviously calf is smaller than the cow, and so they're not eating as much. We were able to take distillers completely out of the dry cow diet, and then I was able to increase it in the fall cow diet, which is good because two days from now, the bulls go in with them. So I wanted them on an increasing plane of nutrition, but we were able to put what I wanted for distillers in the weaned calf diet, what I wanted in the fall diet, and still feed less of it overall than we had been feeding when the spring pairs were together, if that makes sense. So um, sometimes you can you can manage, you can finagle things like that, like the weaning to juggle your resources in a confinement system. Um, maybe that'll trigger something for you is, is what that might work for you. But um, the spring spring cows are eating um, just silage and um, uh, mo mostly corn stalks ground up and then a little silage in that to make it wet and make them not waste it. But they weren't overly happy about it the first two days, but they're they're okay with it now. So that that did help us some with that um, easing that uh, availability there. Um, I like feeding after weaning. Not everybody has that ability. Not everybody has the room to do that. And I understand that. But um, because that unevenness seems a little more pronounced, it does give you, you know, 60 to 90 days to kind of even those calves out where they're only competing with each other of the same size. And then the quality of the diet is better because now I'm not going to put um, cornstalk residue in their diet. I'm going to put, you know, oh, hay in there and distillers and um, silage. So that's what I've got in their diet. Um, you could do something different. You could you put whatever in it, but that's just what we did there. Um, so the, the distillers is important in their diet because it supplies escape protein, which is uh, goes straight to, it's not digested in the room and it goes straight to their tissue level for growth, for muscular growth and for structure growth. And that's what I want that calf to have right now. And so I want that commodity in that diet. If I have to take it out of something else, I will, but that I really want that there. 
So um, anyway, the other thing that that weaned cap then, it's on a higher quality diet, so we can maybe even out our size a little bit. The other thing it gives you the option of doing is then being able to market those calves as having had their branding shots, their preconditioning shots, and their booster shot. Um, that can give you a little bit of a premium at the sale barn because they've been well vaccinated and they're ready to go. Um, their bunk broke at this point, so you know, long time weaned, hopefully they're over any illness that they're going to have, that kind of thing. And so that can give you a little boost. And then it can also sometimes help you hit a different market from what everybody else is doing. So, you know, those are things to think through, may work for you, may not, but that's something to think about. Um, just a few more little points, and then we'll just have discussion. One being that, you know, we always think about you got a blow and snowstorm and you need to have some sort of shed for those calves to get in in the middle of snow, but we don't always think about their need for protection from the heat. And in a confinement setting, the that bare ground is just really hot. And if you have an opportunity to provide them with some shade, that is fantastic. That is one benefit of having calves in the equipment yard is that they can get, you know, on the east side of a combine or something, I guess. But um, in this particular picture, the reason I included this is we had laid out some um, residues, wheat straw or corn stalk bales or something. Cows kind of rummaged through them. And so then I thought, well, that didn't really work because the cows just ended up eating them. But they left enough residue there that I look out there the next day and these calves are all like bedded down in that in the middle of the day. And so um, apparently that did lower the temp of that ground and they thought it was fantastic. Um, okay, so, you know, it's not only important to meet the protein and energy demands, but we need to make sure we're supplying the right vitamin and mineral package, um, because a lot of that we're usually assuming that they're getting in a grazed situation and they may be very limited in some of these byproducts and residues and things that we're feeding in a confined setting. And Dr. Drunowski is like a vitamin guru. So if you have questions on that, we're gonna direct those to her, but she has been doing quite a bit of um, research on that aspect of the confined cow as well. And then, you know, in the research pens, we're really good about, in the research setting, we're really good about pen cleaning. And we are terrible about that at home. That's just full confession. And I feel like if, we all made that a little more of a priority to do pen cleaning. We could seriously reduce the pathogen load that's available to the calves and that that can long-term help us with some, you know, making sure everybody stays healthy. Um, it's, it's really good to have a, it's very important to have a good veterinary client relationship. I think in any beef cattle operation, you know, not necessarily just confinement, but any um, changes they may suggest for your area for vaccination schedules and medication protocols, if you do run into a mess or something, um, that can be that you are going to want to have that up front and, and have a good relationship there. And um, I guess just the summary points, residues, byproducts, and wet feeds. Um, I, I think are kind of key for making some of these confined diets work because we can utilize some things that might not be as expensive as our um, mid-range hays. Um, the nutrient management needs of that calf are challenges, but I feel like they're manageable. Um, and I, what I really hope that you get out of this is that you got some ideas for developing a system that's going to work with the resources that you have, because I really don't believe that there's any one right way to do a confinement system. Um, I feel like they all look a little different just based on what you can do with what you have to work with. And I guess with that, um, we can look at the chat box and we can do some discussion. Um, yeah, so feel free to either unmute or to type your questions in the chat. Uh, Carla, I'll actually ask you uh, just one question would be about uh, when you are doing this limit feeding in confinement, you know, you get some boss cows and you get mm -hmm. some, some maybe mm -hmm. some cows who don't get what they need. How often do you do any kind of sorting? Sorting? Um, I 
I usually before I, I mean I'll watch those cows and if I get two or three that get down to what I feel like is um below a five on a one to nine scale and um I'm not and I don't feel like it's related to okay she's pulled down pretty hard because of milking and we are about to increase this diet total for everybody um you know that kind of thing then I I may pull those three cows off and put them in a different pen you know and feed them different but I don't tend to do that more than um once or twice a year and um because we've tried to put them in a bigger area and spread the feed out more than we did in the beginning because in the beginning we did more of the closer to like the research recommendations so smaller pens I had bigger issues than I do now so so you're saying the increased bunk space uh, is, is a huge benefit so maybe going higher in the bunk space can reduce the amount of, of competitive issues that you had yeah yeah I think so cool uh other questions for Carla there is one in the chat box that says for limit feeding cows through the drought, what's the minimum pounds of roughage required? Ooh, um, a minimum. I think a minimum feed, I, I tell you what we have done, and I guess I don't know how low you can go. And I think that's a question people ask a lot. And I guess I've never been brave enough to, to try it. Um, but I will tell you that we have fed as low as 1.3% of body weight in a um, research setting. But in those diets, we had um, wheat straw and some, um, and then some distillers and some beet pulp. So um, there's a lot of fiber in that. Um, for one thing. So I, we did have satiety issues with that, even though it was 